Hello, game theorists. Today we are in chapter 15, looking at voting. You might be wondering, how is voting part of game theory? Well, there is an element of strategy in voting under many different election systems. Maybe you really liked a third party candidate, but you didn't want to waste your vote on them. So you voted for one of the major party candidates instead. That's called strategic voting, and there is a game theory motivation behind that. So, um, major motivation for looking at voting is the Electoral College, which has some very well-known shortcomings. The challenge, though, is that many of the systems proposed to replace it also have shortcomings. So we'll look at a number of different voting systems and look at their strengths and weaknesses and see if we can find something we like better or not. So one important result in um, this area is something called Arrow's Impossibility Theorem. So while it's a lot of things that we disagree upon, of course, there are some common sense principles that Arrow proposes that I think a lot of us would find to be quite reasonable. So you can think about what we'll call a social choice function. So the social choice function, you give it all the possible options out there, and the social choice function tells you what the best one is. Of course, a lot of disagree about what the best policy is, but there are some underlying principles that seem quite reasonable. So, One requirement seems reasonable should be complete. And by that I mean it can compare any two options and tell you which one's better. So if your options are A and B, or there are two candidates or two different policies, you're considering either A is better than B or B is better than A or they're equal. So the social choice rule, this election system or whatever you're looking at, has to be able to come to a result. You can't just plug in the options and have the outcome be, I don't know. So there has to be some kind of decision. Requirement number two, it should be transitive. So by that we mean if, say, um, if A is better than B and B is better than C, then A should also be better than C. That just makes sense. So if, um, say, Biden is better than Trump, and Trump is better than some third-party candidate, then Biden's also better than that third-party candidate. It wouldn't make sense if it were the other way around, where C is better than A, and then you can't really reach a decision. Requirement number three, the social choice rule should respect unanimity. So by that we mean that if every single individual thinks A is better than B, then society as a whole also thinks A is better than B.
So even though probably a lot of different perspectives out here in this class, I think we probably all be on board with these three rules. They all seem pretty reasonable for a social choice function. We might disagree about if A is better than B or not for different policies A and B, but these general principles should seem quite reasonable. Fourth requirement. This is called um, irrelevance, oh, sorry, independence of irrelevant alternatives, or IIA. So what that means is that, let's say you're comparing just A and B. And you decide through your election system or whatever that A is better than B. If you add C to the mix and now you're comparing A, B, and C, then A should still be better than B. Now it's possible, of course, that C is better than both, but this irrelevant alternative C should not flip your preferences over A and B. So you can see why that'd be reasonable. It'd be very strange if you preferred, let's say, let's say you prefer Trump over Biden, if it's just Trump and Biden, but then you prefer Biden over Trump, if it's Trump, Biden, and some third party candidate. That irrelevant alternative C shouldn't change your preferences over Trump versus Biden. And we're calling our fire book talks about no ex external considerations. So the outcome should depend only on votes, not things like traditions or customs based on what X people think is revealed in their votes. And if you support democracy, then number five seems very reasonable. Requirement number six, no dictator. So there is, by that I mean, there's no individual whose preferences perfectly match society's preferences. And again, if you support democracy, number six seems very reasonable indeed. So, again, even though there's a wide variety of viewpoints out here in this class among you guys, I think a lot of us would be on board with, with these six requirements in Arrow's impossibility theorem. The problem, though, is that Arrow proved it's actually impossible to satisfy all six of these. So, if you want to have rules one through five specified, so complete, transitive, unanimous, independence of relevant alternatives, no customs. If you want all that satisfied, then you're going to get a dictator. Arrow proved that. So you want to have all six of these, these um, principles here, but Arrow showed you can't get that.
So because it's impossible, it's satisfy all six. That's why it's called Arrow's impossibility theorem. So there are some examples out there of what um, a dictator agent, they're called a dictator voter, would be like. So if you follow the news, we have 100 senators out there, and they all vote, and all their votes count equally. However, it always really seems to boil down to what does Joe Manchin think? So a moderate Democrat from West Virginia is often the swing vote, so his vote's often the decisive one for or against on any issue. So what the Senate thinks is effectively what Joe Manchin thinks. So he's effectively a dictator agent. Um, until recently, it used to be that you could say that John Roberts in the Supreme Court was a dictator agent. So you had four Supreme Court justices on one side and four on the other, and John Roberts could vote either way. That changed um, after the recent appointment was to replace one of the justices, but until recently, you could argue that John Roberts was often the swing vote, as often the decisive vote in lots of cases. In the Electoral College, we have dictator states. So even though all states have a vote in the presidential election, and all of the people who can vote in the state have a say in it, it all really boils down to what does Pennsylvania think? Or what does some other swing state think? Um, swing states have changed over time. It used to be like um, Ohio used to be a swing state, but not anymore. So in the last couple of elections, Wayne, Pennsylvania was decisive. Whoever wins Pennsylvania wins the presidency. So replacing the current system with having just Pennsylvania vote would give you the exact same outcome. So Arrow's impossibility theorem is often portrayed as a way of saying there's going to be no perfect voting rule. You're going to have some kind of compromise no matter what you're doing. You're have, by compromise, I mean you're compromising some key principle that you want to retain. You're not going to be able to get all the ideal properties. However, if you look at these examples here of what dictator agents look like, um, it might not be quite as bad as what the name might sound. I think about things like dictators in general. I think about things like they jail their political opponents and they have all sorts of human rights violations. Well, these kind of dictators that you see in a democracy, they might have the same property on this definition of being a dictator, but they're not doing the same kind of awful things that I usually associate with dictators. You don't see moderate Pennsylvania voters executing their political enemies, for example. You don't see John Roberts or Joe Manchin doing other horrible things that you associate with dictatorships. So if you can't have all six of these properties of the Arrow's Impossibility Theorem, I think you'd actually relax number six and give that one up and not have some horrible dystopia all the time. There are some cases where dictators, dictator agents are not the worst thing in the world. So I do not construe the arrows and possibility theorem to mean that you're always going to have some kind of bad system. There might be some hope to still find a pretty good system, even though you might have someone who qualifies as a dictator agent. So the main idea is to replace the Electoral College would be with a popular vote, but popular vote can take a couple of different forms. So there is um, what's called majority rule, and there is plurality rule. Unfortunately, a lot of the advocates of popular vote don't really specify which one they prefer and acknowledge what the trade-offs are with either one. So, first of all, our definitions. 
So plurality rule means the, per, the policy or the person with the, most can, with the most votes wins, even if that's not a majority. Under majority rule, you need a majority, so 50% plus one, getting the most votes might not always be enough. So, of course, under majority rule, it's possible that not, there's no candidate gets 50% plus one, if you have three or more candidates, that could split the vote in such a way that no one wins 50% plus one, so you have to have some kind of runoff if no one gets a majority. So there are different systems for how you can run that. So we'll go more into details on this in our next video.